came out in 78, he came out of prison. He was wearing about 150 pounds, something like that, before he gained all that weight and started getting money. Some say he was growing with his bankroll, but he come out and he asked for a sit down with the underground, underground, underworld elite in Detroit. And he had a proposal. He said, listen, he said, we want to take the young guys, we want to take the young guys, we want to take our place in the underworld. He said, but we need the support and approval from the older guys. And he come to them, you know, he said, he set the plan out. He said, look, we're going to try to rest control of Detroit, the inner city, from the day go. Wait, this is Butch Jones said, saying this. Huh? This was Butch Jones saying this? Yeah, he's saying it. He had some meeting. I oh, wasn't wow. at the meeting, but I heard, I heard what went down. Okay. So I like this plan. I like this plan. So on Sunday, this is this is a, a Sunday in uh, probably the first or second week in September of 1978. Okay? So he was, his plan was he asked the uh, Chick Springer was there, Doc was there, uh, Buddy Rose wasn't there. Uh, who else was there? Uh, Charles Holloway, Chuck Holloway. Oh, Frank yeah. was there. Uh, Milwaukee Jack was there. Treacherous was there. Treacherous. Yeah, a guy named Treacherous. Terrible T. Not Tom Morgan, but Terrible Treacherous, they called him. He's from the downtown area. He had a little reputation going on down there. But most of these was the older, older generation. They was older than me, right? So... They was like in control. They had a nebulous control over Detroit. So Bush had the right idea, in my opinion. He went to them and asked for their approval and their support. But they betrayed him. At Sunday afternoon, he, he had set this down up. I don't know who he was, but he pulled up in this little restaurant on, I think it's on West Finkel. And uh, he pulled up, then him and the young boys come over. It's got a low stone fence around it, surrounding, surrounding the perimeter like a parking lot then you go in the restaurant right so the limousine pulled right up by the door there was a button man in the front and the driver and the dime with the capo was in the back so when Bush and them and the young boys come up across the street I looked Doc was standing next to me and I asked Doc I said well ain't you gonna help him cause when he when he when he jumped up the driver the bodyguard got out took the, the capo inside the, the restaurant the driver got out and wrestled Butch and they started wrestling the young boy that was with him took off running. So I looked at Doc, and I asked Doc, and I said, well, what you gonna do, man? He said, let's see what's gonna happen. And I said, well, he ain't got, he, he's the ass is out. So I was by myself. Oh, the, oh the driver started up and just started beating up Butch Jones? Yeah. Oh, wow. When, the, when, the other, when, when his little crew ran, Butch was by himself. This guy was about six foot two, maybe about 240, right? Might have been the Incredible probably, Hulk. Uh, probably Bobby the Hulk. LaPuma. Yeah, or Bobby LaPuma, yeah. Yeah, it's then, uh, in, in, uh, when I come across the street, the bodyguard had come back out with a, with a, with a, with a, uh, a baseball bat. So I'm running across the street, I got a P38 9mm in my, in my back. So I'm running across the street, I pull that. He come out behind, around the limbo, I was coming up on the side where the driver was wrestling with Bush. He had Bush down on the ground and he was beating him. So the guy come up behind me with the baseball bat, I kicked him. He shot the driver in the back of the knee. He picked Butch up in a bomber scare and carried him across the street to the van with me and Red. So Butch was, oh, he was shot. He was in shock. He said, man, he said, who are you? So Red told him, say, man, that's Lester. That's my partner. I said, man, I said, uh, something wrong. I said, I heard about you to sit down. I said, I like what you was trying to do. I said, but listen, that crew that you was with, we need to go find them, let them know what they did by leaving you there. I said, because they were trying, they, they were going to kill you, man. He said, yeah, I know. If it don't be for you, I would have been dead. I said, well, okay, man. Let's go find him and straighten this out. I said, you probably won't never find nobody else like me. That's how me and Butch met. Oh, wow. Later on, I'm, later on, I'm in prison, right? I'm on I'm on third gallery. So a guy come by me. He said, look, man. He said, uh, he said do they call you Lefty? I said, yeah. He said, listen, he said, Butch is my cousin's husband, a man. He said, no, I was calling her Portia. He said, no, he asked me if he was here, the guy named Lefty. And he said, well, he didn't know who Lefty was, but he said, Parkey. He said, well, I know who that is. 
So he came up there and he told me, he said, listen, he said, when, he, when the town cleared, he said, we're going to go call Butch. He want to talk to you. So I went down at the countdown. I thought he called a number. I talked to him. He said, hey, man, how you doing? I said, he was, he was, he was out being here. He asked before he called his case. He said, man, he said, I'm getting a little money, man. He said, I ain't never had nobody do something for me like you did. He said, I want to help you out. He said, can I help you? I said, well, you can't help me, but my re my partner is out there. I said, whatever you want to do for me, give it to him and he'll make sure I get it. So he took my red 35 Gs. Wow. Yeah. Well, what, this, now, was like, this was like 82, 83, 81? This was like 80, I'd say 81. Because I, I got my number August 15th, 1980. So this, I had been there about a year or something and established myself, right? So uh, he, t he took the 35 Gs to him and he off the call, even when, they, when he went to prison the first time, he would call uh, Red, and that was my intermediary. I would call Red, he said, just, just call. I, he just got to talking to him. I said, I don't know, he said, Butch. I said, okay, so how's he doing? You know, we kept in touch like that. So the guy stand up, I, I admire what he did, but because of that incident, now Rick just put it down that if it don't be for me, it wouldn't have been no YBI. But I'm trying to say that he had to, he had changed his mind. He had the right idea, but there's no loyalty among the black underworld. It's just it's no longer. And what they didn't have, what the, what the black ma uh, 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 mafia or the underworld doesn't have, is a child of Luciano. To really they organize don't have it. No yeah. They don't, have the, they don't have the organizational skills, nor do they have the oath of pledges that the Union of Ciceloni had. And that's what Charlie was. He was a Siciliano. He wasn't a Neapolitan. He was a Siciliano. That's where the mafia started at. History will tell you that. That's where all the Detroiters are from, too. They're from Terracini, Sicily. Yeah, Zerillo. Well, actually, yeah. the, uh, I'm going to tell you a little history. My, my attorney, Buffalino's mother, it's Angelo Melli's only daughter. Yeah. Right. That's who his father You have one minute remaining. Okay. In 1979, three headless bodies were found in a van near downtown Detroit, a crime which shocked the country. It was the work of the Detroit Mafia's black hand of death. The long and the short of it was there were three people who got murdered at the... Democratic Club, and that was not a political organization over there on, off of Woodward. And the notoriety of the case came because their heads were cut off and the bodies were found. And of course, if it had just been three dead people, they'd have said, oh, there's three dead people. But when you cut somebody's heads off, then of course it became the crime of the century. Uh, they decapitated uh, three people uh, and left their bodies. I think it was at a location called the Democratic Club. They had uh, several beheadings. They had one guy uh, at a street named Doc Holliday and one guy street name, I think his name was Frank Usher, uh, Frank Mitty. They were black but did most of their work for the Detroit Mafia back when men like the murderous Jackaloni brothers, each suspected in double-digit homicides, still showed their faces on the streets of Detroit and helped flood it with heroin, among other things. Detroit's Murder Row Gang was a name not known to the average person, but was definitely known to the underworld elite of 1970s Motown. When I arrived in Detroit, I saw uh, some of the most dangerous persons that I ever thought existed. I saw a complete disregard for lawfulness, a kind of lawlessness that I never thought existed in any city. Not only was it a violent city, but it was uh, a city that was uh, that had a lot of corruption. They haven't been active in nearly 40 years, but made a huge impact in the gangland heyday of the late 70s, building a mystique and mammoth reputation that still resonates on the streets of Detroit today. The gang was known for moving large quantities of heroin, doing contract hit work from coast to coast, and for the sheer volume of racketeers and cold-blooded killers in their midst. Notorious murder row hitman Chester, the Angel of Death Campbell, recently got a shout out in the British tabloid press. Uh, and the Telegraph recently compared the devilish and cultured Motor City assassin to the fictional John Wick character. 
But in that case, the informant uh, ended up dead and his body was identified. He had been eaten by the field rats and he was identified by a thumbprint that had not been devoured by the field rats. I suspected that uh, Chester killed this person. Chester Campbell liked to frequent museums and operas when he wasn't tracking future murder victims. In other recent Murder Row news, former leader James Jimmy Red Freeman was paroled from prison back in March after 31 years behind bars. And he's a character in a new book penned by a retired U.S. Treasury agent called Down the Rat Hole about an unsolved mob triple murder in Sterling Heights, Michigan. The book theorizes that Red Freeman and others from the role could have played a role in the Time Realty Massacre, which saw three Detroit area bookmakers slain on April 3rd, 85. Back to the beheadings. But according to the testimony, what the, the, the prosecutor's theory was that, let, that Partee and Red Freeman killed the people. Partee is some kind of kin to Frank, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, a cousin or something. But it might be a play cousin. I mean, they were supposed to be the killers. They were the, according to the prosecutor's theory. And the jury convicted Partee, and he's doing life. Another jury acquitted Red Freeman, and he's doing life on another case now. Freeman headed uh, the crew in the 1980s after he beat that case and the gang's original boss.